Welcome to Developing the Leader Within podcast, the podcast that brings you leadership insights from the brightest minds shaping our world. Join us as we dive into conversation with trailblazers, innovators, and change makers, spanning every corner of the globe. Get ready to explore new perspectives, gain actionable insights, and become the leader the world needs today. Unleash your potential. Tune into Developing the Leader Within podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Let's embark on this transformative journey together. Developing the Leader Within podcast, leading beyond limits. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode. Today, we continue to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month and are speaking with Gabriela Ramirez Arellano. Gabriela is a business owner, executive director, board chair, and member, and fellow podcaster. Her mission is to help others navigate their journeys and pursue their dreams, whether in small business or their professional careers. Gabriela, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. It's excited well, for this conversation. Well, we're excited to have you. As folks, we will be speaking about breaking barriers, the secrets to success for Hispanic Latino entrepreneurs. But before we get into that engaging conversation, tell us a little bit about you. Sure. So I would say entrepreneurship kind of found me at one of the most difficult times in my life. I was going through a divorce, and even though I had an MBA, I was really struggling to find a job that paid me more than minimum wage, and I knew that I couldn't support myself and my three kids with that. Um, they were in high school at the time, so you can imagine, and at the time, I decided to sign up for a new program. I was living in Detroit called Prosperous Detroit, and perhaps explore some new opportunities for myself. And then very quickly got a call from one of the organizers asking if I was interested actually in helping to develop and localize the curriculum and English and Spanish. And that was really a turning point for me. I realized that one, that speaking Spanish was something I had taken for granted, but it became my superpower. It allowed me to reach people and communities in ways that others couldn't. And that's when I really, truly not just embraced my entrepreneurial spirit, but I realized the power of entrepreneurship. And then from there, I actually moved to St. Louis, Missouri, and my life totally changed. I started working at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as the business counselor. So I was continuing to support entrepreneurs and really learning so much about how we limit ourselves, but also how many resources are not available to us. And I realized at that time that our voice was still missing. The Latino voice was still missing from the conversation here in the St. Louis region. And so I launched uh, the Authentico podcast with a friend of mine to amplify the voices of Latino leaders and entrepreneurs. And then just yesterday, we had our book launch for a new Latina anthology called Calladitas Rising again, focusing on empowering Latinas and activate their voices. In my day job, I work with entrepreneurs at Cortex and as a volunteer at the Balsa Foundation, helping entrepreneurs just better understand whether it's their value proposition, their clients, um, but also connect and access the resources that they need so that they can be successful in whatever avenue that they decide to explore. Well, I absolutely love that journey. You know, folks, sometimes we find ourselves in a position where we're just at a loss for where our life is going to head. And it's in that loss that we often <laughs> get found, right? You say, hey, entrepreneurship found me. And so glad that it did, because look what has happened from that point on. Not only did it come to you, but you embraced it and now you're giving it forward. And so thank you for the work that you're doing in the Hispanic Latino community, because as you mentioned, that voice is missing sometimes. And I love the title of the book, La Calladita, right? The, the, the quiet ones. And I was talking in a conversation not too long about how we're raised in humility. And often that humility is taken too far on the side of that you need to be quiet and, and let everybody else's voice 
travel above yours, but that's not the case. And you have obviously not made that the case. Now, I was looking at some data back in 2020, the annual business survey, and there's around 331,000 Hispanic-owned employer firms. Now, four years separated, right? But at four years ago, we were about 6% of the 5.7 million employer businesses nationwide. On top of that, Hispanic Latino-owned businesses have been growing at a faster rate than the national average, and it reflects the significant and increasing role of Hispanic Latino entrepreneurs in the U.S. economy. And so we are making our impact in the business world as Latino and Hispanics, but I hardly ever hear about it, right? So that's why we brought you on so we can get this story. And I wanted to ask you, what unique challenges have you faced as a Hispanic Latina entrepreneur and how did you overcome them to get to where you are today? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think I applied for that class because I heard that as a Latina, I'm supposed to have an entrepreneurial spirit. And so having the opportunity to figure out what that spirit was, was essential for me. But personally, one of my biggest challenges facing has been facing and navigating spaces where I'm often the only woman of color or actually the only Latina in the room, right? And so then there's this unspoken pressure put on by myself many times to not only prove myself, but to represent our entire community. And so early on, I realized that if I really wanted to overcome these challenges, I had to be unapologetically myself. Now, it didn't happen overnight. It took me a long time to get to this, and there's still times when I'm like struggling and so I reach out to someone but I really just decided that I needed to tap into my strengths and my culture and heritage were a big part of that Um, and rather than hiding from them they gave me power the other thing would be um, mentorship right finding allies who believed in me and my vision was crucial because then I had that sounding board whenever I doubted myself or whenever I had questions or even when I was negotiating this current job to be able to reach out to someone and say, hey, what do you think about the job? What do you think about salary? What do you think about, you know, what it would mean for my career, not just the financial, the financial pieces, right? And so um, in that process, I learned the importance of building strong networks. And it's something that I'm really advocating for with our entrepreneurs and the people that I work with. How do we continue to build a community that shares insights, supports, and sometimes just a word of encouragement. And that was another reason why the book is important and the podcast, I feel like really align with the work because we have to hear it and it has to come from a lot of different ways. Sometimes we're tericos, right? Like (laughs) we're hard headed. Yeah, absolutely. Now you mentioned earlier the superpower, right? You realize that, hey, Spanish, is a thing right now and and it's getting me somewhere we often negate the power that that is my original first language was spanish right i learned english and although after years now i'm speaking it at the level that i am it was learned and so for those of you out there that are kind of negating the power of your spanish ability don't i was on a ship once and you know meteorology and oceanography was what i did but I was not called for that. I was called to the bridge because we was going through the Strait of Gibraltar at the moment into the Mediterranean, and they needed a Spanish translator. And they said, you know, they called me right up. And I was surprised. People knew I knew Spanish, but they knew more that I was Puerto Rican than, hey, how well is his Spanish? But it was one of those things that, que me destacó, right? It took me out from the element of every other sailor and put me in a position where I was not only useful for the journey through the uh, Strait of Gibraltar, but I also got paid for it. So it was a great win-win on that aspect. But a lot of times we negate that power. A lot of times we also negate the power of our culture. And I wanted to ask you, how has your cultural background influenced your approach to business and leadership? Yeah, definitely. I would say my cultural background has is deeply woven into my approach to business and leadership. 
Now that was not always the case, right? It was when I got asked to to create the curriculum that I realized, oh wow, they're asking me not just because I speak Spanish, but because I understand the community, I understand the culture, I understand that we can't just translate a session on business planning exactly, <clears throat> excuse me, and it would be the same thing. And so to me, that was one of the first times where I realized that it, it, it truly was a superpower. Like I said, not just the speaking Spanish, but understanding community and understanding that people have different needs. Um, we have a strong sense of family and loyalty and resilience in the Latino community. And I carry those values with me in everything that I do. I work really hard to lead with empathy. empathy. Um, and I also really prioritize building authentic relationships. Um, networking for me was really difficult just because I really, the idea of going somewhere to collect business cards was not something I was comfortable with. I didn't know how to start the conversation. I often felt like, oh my gosh, I just don't like people. I'm just going to stay at home. But my job at the, at the chamber didn't really allow me to do that. I had to network. I had to get out. Um, and honestly, I had to do some soul searching on my own to better understand why was I having why was I telling myself that story? Um, so I work with the coach during the pandemic and really, you know, if I turn it around, maybe it wasn't so much that I didn't like people. It was the defense mechanism of me saying, let me not like the people or the situation before they don't like me. And so that was a learning point, another learning point for me. And so now I try to also be conscious of that, that our community doesn't always network the same, right? We like to build those relationships. We can create more opportunities when we don't try to do everything by ourselves. So also the power of your net worth. Um, how do we leverage our community um, and know that it's important to lift each other up, but also, which I feel like is another, at least for me, cultural has been a cultural barrier is asking for help. So I've learned the importance of flexibility and really trying to navigate this dual identity that has, in a way, taught me to adapt quickly and embrace different perspectives because I've had different perspectives and I, I can see how our community needs some additional support. And if I can provide it, I love that. Some of that has just been um, really opening our growth mindset to ask for help because we're also, like you said, we're, we are raised in humility. So asking for help is sometimes really difficult, but it's really something that we have to start to flex that muscle. Paired with the humility, we also have some that are raised in pride. <laughs> and so that battle to understand the balance between those two is often hard and difficult to navigate for us. But a lot of us kind of overcome it by seeing the strength on both sides. You know, there is time to be prideful, Hispanic Heritage Month is the one to name right off the bat. Although you don't have to give us one month, we'll probably do it the whole year long. But along with humility or not wanting to be in big groups and things like that, it's one of the challenges that we often face. But community is really what drives us to be able to excel. You mentioned network, right? This podcast is happening because of a network connection, right? Someone knew me, someone knew you. They said, hey, you two need to talk, and here we are. So community is very important as we execute not only our daily life, but our entrepreneurship life. So what role do community support and networking play in helping Hispanic Latino entrepreneurs succeed? Because it's one of those untapped things that we have that we just don't take advantage of. Yeah, definitely. Like I was saying, like I actually recently learned that your network is your net worth. That was not something that I grew up having heard. So it really wasn't until I moved to St. Louis um, and that I joined a mastermind group and the group of ladies that I get to spend those monthly sessions with really has opened my eyes to a whole new world of possibility and looking at supporting each other and networking in a totally different way. But community, like you said, is a big part of our culture and our community. And in many ways, it's the foundation of success. For me, like you said, we would not be here today without that other person that knew both of us. 
Um, it's more than business connections, right? It's about building trust and creating a support system where we can share resources, celebrate wins, and also weather the challenges. For me, when I moved to St. Louis, I didn't know anybody. My, my family was here, but I didn't really feel like I had knowledge of any community members. And so I reached out to my friends in Detroit saying, hey, anybody know anyone in St. Louis? And of course, they were able to connect me with one person. And that one person then connected me to two or three more. And, and, and it just went on like that. But I think that sometimes... At least for me, I was shy or apprehensive about meeting new people. And so we also need to understand, like, what do we like to do? How can we be a part of community in ways that make sense for us? Um, so organizations like the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce really helped a lot. Even though I worked there, I was also a member because my husband and I uh, owned a restaurant it allowed us to learn from others and also share like their lessons learned, things that they had experienced, how they had overcome things. And that was another reason why I really wanted to create the Authentico podcast because I didn't see a platform or a place where we could share those lessons. Why, why do I have to struggle as a podcast host when I could just reach out to you, Enrique, and say, hey, you know, what platform are you using or how are you distributing or where are you finding your guests, whatever. But how do we provide those spaces where we can see ourselves in leadership roles while we're connecting with like-minded individuals and accessing the resources that may not be readily available otherwise. So for me, it's the power of connection and belonging that makes a total difference and I know that if it's something I want and I struggle with, there are probably hundreds of people out there that also are doing it. And so that's another reason why um, really working to make sure that especially Latinos, but all entrepreneurs in the region have access to those networks and those resources um, to make sure that whatever they decide to do with their business, right? I really look at small business development also as workforce development because we are learning strategic thinking skills, communication skills, problem solving, uh, and the business piece of it can open your eyes and you realize, oh, wow, this business is not going to work. And then you pivot and do something different, but the skill sets stay with you. Or maybe you realize, oh, now that I have these additional skills, I can scale my business forward. So Entrepreneurship to me is just uh, an entryway or a door to so many other possibilities that community is so vital to achieve that. Absolutely. And you mentioned resources, some of them, the chamber, some of them are the program that you went through. So what key resources or tools do you believe are essential for aspiring Hispanic Latino entrepreneurs to build a successful business? Well, like I said before, for me, mentorship has been huge. So having access to mentors and, and even the word mentors, I think, is a little bit intimidating. Having access to other people who understand our unique cultural and economic challenges uh, is essential because these individuals can help guide us to navigate industries that maybe we're not familiar with um, or maybe we're not traditionally represented. Um, second, I would say for a lot of the entrepreneurs, not just Latino, financial literacy and access to capital continues to be a big problem to get our businesses started or to scale. Uh, too often, we don't have the same access to funding or financial institutions. Um, and that goes both ways, right? I see both sides in the work that I do. On the one hand, the institutions don't always um have a presence in the community or haven't built a trust, or maybe they don't have the access points where they need to be. But I also see where we still don't want to have a credit score, or we don't understand what that is, or maybe we haven't handled our finances the best. And so how do we meet each other in the middle um, by learning more about how to manage our finances, how to secure investments and leverage the resources that we have but also how do we hold the institutions accountable for building trust in our communities and to have a presence in our communities before we need them and not once we're stressing out. Um, for example, my husband and I are opening a new restaurant 
and we're behind schedule. And so we're trying to figure out, do we need a line of credit? Do we need a loan? But if we get a loan, we have to start paying right away. So like even understanding what the options are that you don't have to get a loan um, is very important. And then I would say the last thing, I mean, there's a ton of things, but I don't want to go on and on forever. But the other thing would be a strong digital presence, whether it's through social media, content creation, e-commerce platforms. It really is key for us as business owners for our business to have a presence on online and also to understand the technology, which is changing so fast. Uh, and sometimes that means that we can't manage it ourselves, that we have to hire it out once we're once we're ready, right? You, you have to be at the stage where you're ready to contract out and pay for those services. Um, so how do you stay abreast or on top of the trends and the technology as you're managing it yourself? There's so much at our disposal, technology being one of the fastest things that we're getting because we'll get it and it's pushed out. But sometimes you miss all that. And I don't know how many people have said, oh, that's available. And I'm like, that was available years ago. And so it, having somebody tapped in, if you can't do it, folks, if you can't literally sit there, kind of do your research and try to get all that information, then have a resource that you can go to that will tell you about the current trends. He, uh, you know, on LinkedIn, there are people who speak about certain things. Hey, tie into them, make them part of your network, connect with them, ask that, hey, I see that you talk about this. Can I follow and tag along? Because, you know, what you're sharing is important to my business. Make those connections, build that network, build that community and get the resources that you need uh, because we do need and rely on those things. Now you mentioned, uh, Gabriela institutions, and now we know that government and things like credit score driven by a, an organization. So how can institutions, whether they're government, education, finance sectors, better support the growth of Hispanic Latino owned businesses? Because I knew, I know that they have a role in it. Yeah, they definitely have a role. And sometimes I rock the boat here in St. Louis because I feel like they're not taking as active a role as they should or could to the benefit of both themselves and the community. But I think the first step is understanding that Latinos, Hispanic, Latinx, Latin, whatever you decide to call us at any given time, we're not a monolith, right? And so there is not a one size fits all approach one, we all speak a different type of Spanish for in, in one way or another, right? Whether we say popote for straw or we say uh, pitillo for straw or whatever it is, sorbete, um, we have different types of Spanish. And then that also means that we've had different types of experiences. And so how can institutions, whether they be government, education, or financial, really start to understand that very fact that we are not a one size fits all. And so one approach is not going to work and they will have to do some trial and error to understand what is the Latino Hispanic community that I'm trying to reach in my area. And it could change from sector to sector, like Kansas City has a large Latino population compared to St. Louis. Um, but as institutions are trying to serve us better, they need to also prioritize that outreach needs to be in multiple languages, that um, there is a lot of support needed in navigating some of these bureaucratic systems like applying for licensing or permits or even grants or securing small business loans. Um, schools can be more inclusive, creating opportunities for students or giving them hands-on experiences to connect them with business leaders, right? And start that introductions to mentors and to meeting other people that look like us that's for me that was a big piece that was missing that had been missing and so now how can I create that for others um, I think also the financial institutions they've started to but they still need to work on building that trust with our community um, many in many of our countries banking institutions are not the most trusted they're very bureaucratic um, there's a lot of red tape and a lot of formality in it 
and it's a little bit more flexible here, but perhaps by offering more flexible opportunities to connect and really understand the financial resources and education that we need. Um, at the end of the day, they need to recognize as well that the contributions of Latino entrepreneurs uh, and invest in our potential. Like you said, the number of businesses that we're starting is way above the percentage of non of native born or non Latino entrepreneurs. And so, as we continue to you know open restaurants or uh, <clears throat> in other institutions, other businesses, I, I know uh, one of the businesses here by a local company is uh, a guy from Spain and he's doing amazing work with NASA. So there are entrepreneurs in all the sectors and we need to know that there are institutions that want to help us. Sometimes that's not how we perceive, especially the banking institutions. There's a lot of work in government to help ease some of the licensing and regulation for like the food trucks and the food businesses. Um, but it's also important for organizations like the Hispanic Chamber here in St. Louis, who is advocating for some of these changes, right? And trying to work with the organization so that they could understand. At one time, I remember we were hosting a lot of like uh, home education classes for the community. It might not be tied to business per se, but helping potential homeowners understand that you know, they could have their American dream, but they need to know what they need. They need to know that it might not happen today. So if they need to build their credit score, but how do we continue to collectively and intentionally provide opportunities so that uh, people have access to this information and these resources, whether it's through the banking institutions, government, schools, even organizations that host free programming like SCORE or SBDC, um, and sometimes it's also us, right? What are we doing? How are we proactively going out to say, hey, I, I'm going to need a loan for this business. Let me start finding out now, six months before or three months before, what my credit score is, what I need to do to get started, and even what my options are, because you don't have to accept the first bank loan that you get offered or that you qualify for. You also want to look at the interest rate, the terms. Oh my God, I could just go on and on. Sorry. <laughs> No, I love it. No, that's the type of information that we do need to have at our disposal so that we don't go down roads thinking that, oh, this is the only thing. Oh, thank goodness that I got this one. Let me take it now because there are so many different options. I love the suggestions that you have given there. Now, I wanted to highlight something because we did mention early on that Hispanic-owned employer firms represents 6%. That 6% is 331,000 people, right? So Latinos, uh, Hispanics. Just to give you a perspective, the U.S. Navy active duty numbers as of 23 was 332,000. We represent as Hispanic Latino business owners about the same number of active duty Navy personnel. It is a force. We are a force. Yes, we represent 6%, but it is a force that we're representing. And it's important for you to understand that because sometimes we feel like we're the underdogs, but no, look at the numbers. We are actual force to be reckoned with, if you ask me, and we should be representing. And I love that you say, hey, sometimes I rock the boat. It's okay. <laughs> sometimes you got to if you want to see what you're looking for. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you for al allowing us to get uh, this information. Now, I know that you do a lot of things and you say, hey, and on top of that, I got the day job, right? <laughs> but what do you have coming up and how can the viewer or listener get a hold of you? Yeah. So we actually, like I said at the beginning, we just launched our new anthology, Calladitas Rising really based on the premise that for for many of us especially girls in in our community we often hear the phrase calladita te ves más bonita right so the quieter you are the prettier you are which just says you know don't rock the boat keep your head down uh, maybe don't raise your voice or make a big deal about things and we wanted to have this first anthology be kind of um 
a cry that we're not doing it anymore. So reclaiming our voice and our strength and our power. Really excited about that. We have our book signing coming up on October the 15th. So folks can definitely go to Amazon and get a copy of the book. Um, And also working with Authentico Podcast to continue to expand and leverage the voices of Latinos, not just here in St. Louis in the region, but we've had interviews from all over the country. So really excited to continue to do that. And then supporting entrepreneurs. I love it. I love being able to be a, part, a small part of an entrepreneur's journey. Like I said, my, re- my husband and I are opening a new restaurant. It's killing me some days and I just want to say, forget it, I'm done. But it's his passion and we're moving forward. So look forward to sharing more information about that when the restaurant opens and just continuing to be a resource. How do I continue to uplift others? So if there's a collaboration that someone has an idea with, I'm one of those crazy idea people that until it doesn't work, I'm like, it's going to work. Let's make it happen. Um, But no, definitely appreciate the opportunity, Enrique, to share, to to have this voice. Um, I hope that folks continue to understand that we are a very connected community and that we continue to reach out to each other, whether it's for help, a question, support. There's much to be done, but we can't do it by ourselves. Absolutely. And it's been a pleasure having you and providing the space for you to share your knowledge with the audience. Now, we will have all those links in the show notes and the video so that folks can get a hold of that a resource and what you're doing. Folk, today's episode is sponsored by Fantail Services and Superpass, which are powering our website and app, Southern Sweet and Sassy Coffee, another Hispanic-owned business, The Outlier Project, and Duco. And if you've enjoyed this episode and learned something interesting about the topic covered today, make sure to subscribe and let us know by leaving a comment. And we're always looking for new ideas and guests to have on our show. So if you know of someone or a topic that you would like featured on the podcast, or want to sponsor our show, we love to hear about it by emailing us at triadleadershipsolutions at gmail.com. And this podcast is brought to you by StreamYard, a browser-based tool that lets you live stream to any platform and record podcasts in studio quality. And we're using it to record this podcast. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode where we dissect leadership from another angle. And as we like to end the show, success to you.